Section zero of En Route. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. En Route by Jory Karl Heismans. Translated by Charles Keegan Paul. Translator's Note. It is seldom fair to an author, nor does it raise the value of literature, to imagine too readily that a writer is himself depicted in his works. We rob Sir Walter Scott of much of his creative power if we assert that in Red Gauntlet are exact portraits of himself and his father. Nor is it just criticism to declare that Shakespeare left a likeness of himself in Hamlet. No one can, of course, create any fictitious character unless he have in himself undeveloped possibilities, some of which he sketches in his books, and, at times, he may have prophesied his own future course in the events under which he has brought the characters in his narrative. It would be intrusive and impertinent to declare that Monsieur Heismans has written an analysis of himself, or a full description of his own conversion under the name of Durtal, because, though it is quite needless for the understanding of en route durtal is also the hero of a former book la bas where an experience is made of satanism black masses and other forms of detestable impiety known in france and at this moment under investigation in the law courts but so far as we are aware unknown in england in france as a rule the population is catholic french protestants who answer very much to our unitarians are confined for the most part to certain centres form isolated knots in other places they do not in any sense leaven the people hence when a frenchman loses faith he has not as in england a protestant sect handy in joining which he may believe as much or as little as he please but in which morals at least are upheld he plunges only too often into sinful excesses now and then into some complicated and enormous crime becoming actively hostile to the dominant religion of his country since it meets him at every turn he cannot be indifferent to nor ignore it he is aided in his revolt not by religious sects bulwarks at least against the denial of god but by societies of freethinkers solidaires freemasons etc bound to an active warfare with the church and sworn to keep the priest away from their families so far as in them lies especially at the hour of birth by refusing baptism in the hour of death by withholding the last sacraments and after death by insisting on civil funerals in the many episcopal approvals bestowed on an admirable little french book setting forth devotions a guild and a cloistered community in aid of the dying much is said of the work of freemasons we are probably safe in saying that english freemasons are only members of a convivial society who knowing nothing of the splendour of church vestments banners and furniture or of confraternities in which even the laity may share have adopted their own ornate badges and ritual freemasons in england might well be let alone by the church and would do no harm were it not that it is the boast of every mason that his society is one all the world over and in france in italy and elsewhere it has allied itself with much that is detestable and irreligious we may take it then that when in france a man of position puts himself in distinct antagonism to the church and this is of course very different to ignoring it or taking it for granted without writing about it he is appealed to not as in england by protestants but by freemasons solidaire even by satanism and the more he thinks of religion the viler and more terrible is the temptation that assails him is the home which offers itself to his spirit this m heismans has realized he is a frenchman who knows his people and in the book now presented to the reader he shows us a man who having passed through the most terrible ordeals of unbelief has been suddenly converted to faith but has not reformed his life en route is the study of the struggles of such an one while incidentally it contains also essays on church music architecture and other arts on monasticism on the lives of the saints and on mysticism faith is assumed after a course of unbelief and no explanation of the return to it is afforded many have taken in hand particularly of late years to give each an apologia pro vita sua but it will be noticed that the exact process is as little explicable as the quickening of life in the womb the soul awakes and says i believe it has come about by the sudden eruption of grace and not by any statement of syllogisms any admission of premises any conscious drawing of conclusions 
remembering this the catholic has no right to be disappointed if he feels tongue-tied in the presence of those who do not see as he sees he cannot argue he cannot hope to do outwardly what god did in his own case secretly he recognizes that in spiritual matters men are not swayed by argument which may well defend but not carry a position in religion debate seldom bears sway the daughter of debate is not concord but discord the church collectively has learnt what each man individually learns and to which he must perforce reconcile himself that there is little active zeal for conversions among catholic priests christ must be preached the message has to be delivered but in a nation where he is already known all that the priest can do is to wait till the soul obeys divine grace and then be ready with all necessary help it is not the church's business to go forth and argue with the intellects of those to whose hearts god himself appeals whom discussion would only harden preaching does not necessarily carry the gift of faith to the listener however true it may be that god often uses it as a vehicle for conferring the gift the gift of faith is his greatest gift and no frenchman no italian no spaniard no german of that part of the great teutonic nation which has remained catholic would hesitate for a moment to accept certain words of cardinal newman at which many of our own countrymen have cavilled the cardinal speaks of a beggar woman who has the gift of faith but who may still have many vices as nearer to the heart of god than many far more respectable than she in m heisman's book faith is taken as axiomatic and there is little attempt to explain it though love for art and hereditary tendencies had some part to play in the ready acceptance of the gift the book is an account of the route taken by such an one towards a holy life there is another reason why we have no right to assume that this is an autobiography the inviolability of the confessional has two sides the penitent has as a rule no right to make his verbal confession to the world as the hero is here presented as doing though a writer may naturally give an imaginary confession just as to teach a penitent how to confess an imaginary form might be suggested in a manual of moral theology and of course in rare cases as that of saint augustine there may be occasional reasons for breaking through the rule of expedient reticence the special trials in durtal's way are those of the flesh and here again we recognize a vast difference between the temper and tone of the english and french nations it is true that when the author brings his hero to actual statements and he asks is it necessary that i go into details the monk who is exercising his office says no it is not necessary thereby agreeing with an experienced jesuit father who a year or two since told his retreatants that when they unburthened their sins and sorrows they must always be careful to respect the modesty of the confessional and that the priest would understand a veiled language yet durtal writes in narrative certain matters which a translation must hide and merely hint that can be said in french openly which english men would not say to each other in private this arises from a fundamental difference in the manner in which the two nations view certain facts of human nature a young englishman who goes wrong throws as a rule some glow or glamour of imagination over his coarsest excesses justifying his deeds if he think of them by his imagination or by some overmastering need a young frenchman takes the same acts as matters of course needing no veil and no excuse the present book is essentially intact some half dozen passages are softened in phrase it has not been considered necessary to the truth of rendering to give each word its exact equivalent if indeed there be always such an equivalent we have acted on the advice of the trappist in the book and the jesuit in actual english life to respect the modesty of the confessional but however outspoken a frenchman may be about his sins he admits that they are sins and that if he have faith it behooves him to lead a decent life hence m heismans is bound by the exigencies of his story to make durtal endeavour to reform led by his love of art church architecture and church services appeal to him and as in his former life he was attracted by the abnormal and the monstrous so now the strange lives and experiences of the mystic saints help him on the road the commonplace repels him hence he cannot away with the music in and the architecture of the churches of paris he is not attracted by the secular clergy his retreat his first confession his first communion since his childhood are made in a trappist monastery and the true interest in the book is its defence of the monastic orders and the description of such a life as seen from very near here is as it appears to us the extraordinary value of the book for english readers 
no one in england is likely to undervalue the secular clergy it is they whom we know st thomas of canterbury one of the most familiar among our english heroes is their patron from them with one exception are drawn the whole of our english hierarchy they have charge of the enormous majority of our parishes and by consequence they with the exceptions of the oratorians a congregation and the jesuits are the guides of our laity the friars dominicans franciscans and servites hold outposts of our london life but monks benedictines trappists cistercians carthusians are known but to few these are they whom this book upholds as the true masters of the spiritual life go to a monastery to make a retreat is in fact the teaching of this book take a monk as your director but if a director be needed in paris go to a jesuit or sulpician you can never astonish a monk says one of them to durtal and indeed this may well be believed after reading the record of the trials to which those are subject who give themselves to the cloistered life some years ago a nonconformist minister in england wrote a book on how to make the best of both worlds and though few would put his thesis in so bold a form this is really what most persons are endeavouring to do both within and without the church they ignore the tremendous conflict now going on between the powers of light and darkness satan and hell are scarcely to be mentioned to ears polite the late canon kingsley once began a sermon in eversley church much as follows my friends you believe in god but there are few indeed here who believe in the devil and the same might be said with absolute truth to almost all christian congregations it is not possible to ignore satan in the cloister the hidden life is that which he most assails the shades are deepest when the sun of righteousness is brightest the cloister is the divinely appointed expiation for the sins of the world those who cannot understand the devotion of a carmelite or a trappist and assert that an active life whereof results may at once be seen is the only one which ought to be consecrated to god will do well to remember that in the expiatory life of jesus himself the years of his active ministry were in the exact proportion of one to ten of the years of his whole life those who have come nearest to him in his sufferings have had the most acute consciousness that they were also taking on them a share of his expiatory life the translation here presented to the reader is as full and as faithful as the genius of another language and another nation will allow it has not seemed to the translator that it could be treated as a mere romance written for amusement only it is indeed attractive as is all written from the heart may it speak to the heart of many men in england as it seems to have already done in france and may it be acceptable to his sacred heart to whose compassionate redeeming and expiatory love it is offered End of section zero. Part one, chapter one of En Route by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. During the first week in November, the week within the octave of all souls, Durtal entered Saint Sulpice at eight o'clock in the evening he often chose to turn into that church because there was a trained choir and because he could there examine himself at peace apart from the crowd the ugliness of the nave with its heavy vaulting vanished at night the aisles were often empty it was ill-lighted by a few lamps it was possible for a man to chide his soul in secret as if at home durtal sat down behind the high altar on the left in the aisle along the rue de saint sulpice the lamps of the choir organ were lighted far off in the almost empty nave an ecclesiastic was preaching he recognized by the unctuousness of his delivery and his oily accent a well-fed priest who poured on his audience according to his wont his best-known commonplaces why are they so devoid of eloquence thought durtal i have had the curiosity to listen to many of them and they are much the same they only vary in the tones of their voice according to their temperament some are bruised down in vinegar others steeped in oil there is no such thing as a clever combination and he called to mind orators petted like tenors montsabre didon those coquelins of the church and lower yet than those products of the catholic training school that bellicose booby the abbe d'ulst afterwards he continued come the mediocrities each puffed by the handful of devotees who listen to them if those cooks of the soul had any skill 
if they served their clients with delicate meats theological essences gravies of prayer concentrated sources of ideas they would vegetate misunderstood by their flocks so on the whole it is all for the best the low watermark of the clergy must conform to the level of the faithful and indeed providence has provided carefully for this the stamping of shoes then the movement of chairs grinding on the flags interrupted him the sermon was over then a great stillness was broken by a prelude from the organ which dropped to a low tone a mere accompaniment to the voices a slow and mournful chant arose the de profundis the blended voices sounded under the arches intermingling with the somewhat raw sounds of the harmonicas like the sharp tones of breaking glass resting on the low accompaniment of the organ aided by basses so hollow that they seemed to have descended into themselves as it were underground they sprang out chanting the verse de profundis ad te clamavi do and then stopped in fatigue letting the last syllables mine fall like a heavy tear then these voices of children near breaking took up the second verse of the psalm domine ex audi vocem meam and the second half of the last word again remained in suspense but instead of separating and falling to the ground there to be crushed out like a drop it seemed to gather itself together with a supreme effort and fling to heaven the anguished cry of the disincarnate soul cast naked and in tears before god and after a pause the organ aided by two double basses bellowed out carrying all the voices in its torrent baritones tenors basses not now serving only as sheaths to the sharp blades of the urchin voices but openly with full-throated sound yet the dash of the little soprani pierced them through all at once like a crystal arrow then a fresh pause and in the silence of the church the verses mourned out anew thrown up by the organ as by a springboard as he listened with attention endeavouring to resolve the sounds closing his eyes durtal saw them at first almost horizontal then rising little by little then raising themselves upright then quivering in tears before their final breaking suddenly at the end of the psalm when the response of the antiphon came et lux perpetua luceat eis the children's voices broke into a sad silken cry a sharp sob trembling on the word eis which remained suspended in the void these children's voices stretched to breaking these clear sharp voices threw into the darkness of the chant some whiteness of the dawn joining their pure soft sounds to the resonant tones of the basses piercing as with a jet of living silver the sombre cataract of the deeper singers they sharpened the wailing strengthened and embittered the burning salt of tears but they insinuated also a sort of protecting caress balsamic freshness lustral help they lighted in the darkness those brief gleams which tinkle in the angelus at dawn of day they called up anticipating the prophecies of the text the compassionate image of the virgin passing in the pale light of their tones into the darkness of that sequence the de profundis so chanted was incomparably beautiful that sublime prayer ending in sobs at the moment when the soul of the voices was about to overpass human limits gave a wrench to durtal's nerves and made his heart beat then he wished to abstract himself and cling especially to the meaning of that sorrowful plaint in which the fallen being calls upon its god with groans and lamentations those cries of the third verse came back to him wherein calling on his saviour in despair from the bottom of the abyss man now that he knows he is heard hesitates ashamed knowing not what to say the excuses he has prepared appear to him vain the arguments he has arranged seem to him of no effect and he stammers forth if thou o lord shalt observe iniquities lord who shall endure it it is a pity said durtal to himself that this psalm which in its first verses chants so magnificently the despair of humanity becomes in those which follow more personal to king david i know well he went on that we must accept the symbolic sense of this pleading admit that the despot confounds his own cause with that of god that his adversaries are the unbelievers and the wicked that he himself according to the doctors of the church prefigures the person of christ but yet the memory of his fleshly desires and the presumptuous praise he gives to his incorrigible people contracts the scope of the poem happily the melody has a life apart from the text a life of its own 
not arising out of mere tribal dissensions but extending to all the earth chanting the anguish of the time to be born as well as of the present day and of the ages which are no more the de profundus had ceased after a silence the choir intoned a motet of the eighteenth century but durtal was only moderately interested in human music in churches what seemed to him superior to the most vaunted works of theatrical or worldly music was the old plain chant that even and naked melody at once ethereal and of the tomb the solemn cry of sadness and lofty shout of joy those grandiose hymns of human faith which seem to well up in the cathedrals like irresistible geysers at the very foot of the romanesque columns what music however ample sorrowful or tender is worth the de profundis chanted in unison the solemnity of the magnificat the splendid warmth of the lauda sion the enthusiasm of the salve regina the sorrow of the miserere and the stabat mater the majestic omnipotence of the te deum artists of genius have set themselves to translate the sacred texts vittoria josquin de pre palestrina orlando lasso handel bach haydn have written wonderful pages often indeed they have been uplifted by the mystic effluence the very emanation of the middle ages forever lost and yet their works have retained a certain pomp and in spite of all are pretentious as opposed to the humble magnificence the sober splendour of the gregorian chant with them the whole thing came to an end for composers no longer believed yet in modern times some religious pieces may be cited of le sieur wagner berlioz and cesar franck and in these again we are conscious of the artist underlying his work the artist determined to show his skill thinking to exalt his own glory and therefore leaving god out we feel ourselves in the presence of superior men but men with their weaknesses their inseparable vanity and even the vice of their senses in the liturgical chant created almost always anonymously in the depth of the cloisters was an extraterrestrial well without taint of sin or trace of art it was an uprising of souls already freed from the slavery of the flesh an explosion of elevated tenderness and pure joy it was also the idiom of the church a musical gospel appealing like the gospel itself at once to the most refined and the most humble ah the true proof of catholicism was that art which it had founded an art which has never been surpassed in painting and sculpture the early masters mystics in poetry and in prose in music plain chant in architecture the romanesque and gothic styles and all this held together and blazed in one sheaf on one and the same altar all was reconciled in one unique cluster of thoughts to revere adore and serve the dispenser showing to him reflected in the soul of his creature as in a faithful mirror the still immaculate treasure of his gifts then in those marvellous middle ages wherein art foster child of the church encroached on death and advanced to the threshold of eternity and to god the divine concept and the heavenly form were guessed and half perceived for the first and perhaps for the last time by man they answered and echoed each other art calling to art the virgins had faces almond shaped elongated like those ogives which the gothic style contrived in order to distribute an ascetic light a virginal dawn in the mysterious shrine of its naves in the pictures of the early masters the complexion of holy women becomes transparent as paschal wax and their hair is pale as golden grains of frankincense their childlike bosoms scarcely swell their brows are rounded like the glass of the pyx their fingers taper their bodies shoot upwards like delicate columns their beauty becomes as it were liturgical they seem to live in the fire of stained glass borrowing from the flaming whirlwind of the rose windows the circles of their aureoles the ardent blue of their eyes the dying embers of their lips keeping for their garments the colours they disdain for their flesh stripping them of their light changing them when they transfer them to stuffs into opaque tones which aid still more by their contrast to declare the seraphic clearness of their look the grievous paleness of the mouth to which according to the proper of the season the scent of the lily of the canticles or the penitential fragrance of myrrh in the psalms lend their perfume then among artists was a coalition of brains a welding together of souls painters associated themselves in the same ideal of beauty with architects they united in an indestructible relation cathedrals and saints only reversing the usual process they framed the jewel according to the shrine and modelled the relics for the reliquary 
on their side the sequences chanted by the church had subtle affinities with the canvases of the early painters vittoria's responses for tenebrae are of a like inspiration and an equal loftiness with those of quentin mazzi's great work the entombment of christ the regina coeli of the flemish musician lasso has the same good faith the same simple and strange attraction as certain statues of Reredos or religious pictures of the elder bruegel lastly the miserere of josquin de pre choir master of louis Duz, has like the panels of the early masters of burgundy and flanders a patient intention a stiff thread-like simplicity but also it exhales like them a truly mystical savour and its awkwardness of outline is very touching the ideal of all these works is the same and attained by different means as for plain chant the agreement of its melody with architecture is also certain it also bends from time to time like the sombre romanesque arcades and rises shadowy and pensive like complete vaulting the de profundis for instance curves in on itself like those great groins which form the smoky skeleton of the bays it is like them slow and dark extends itself only in obscurity and moves only in the shadow of the crypts sometimes on the other hand the gregorian chant seems to borrow from gothic its flowery tendrils its scattered pinnacles its gauzy rolls its tremulous lace its trimmings light and thin as the voices of children then it passes from one extreme to another from the amplitude of sorrow to an infinite joy at other times again the plain music and the christian music to which it gave birth lend themselves like sculpture to the gaiety of the people associate themselves with simple gladness and the sculptured merriment of the ancient porches they take the popular rhythm of the crowd as in the christian carol adeste fideles and in the paschal hymn o filii et filii they become trivial and familiar like the gospels submitting themselves to the humble wishes of the poor lending them a holiday tune easy to catch a running melody which carries them into pure regions where these simple souls can cast themselves at the indulgent feet of christ born of the church and bred up by her in the choir schools of the middle ages plain chant is the aerial and mobile paraphrase of the immovable structure of the cathedrals it is the immaterial and fluid interpretation of the canvases of the early painters it is a winged translation but also the strict and unbending stole of those latin sequences which the monks built up or hewed out in the cloisters in the far-off olden time now it is changed and disconnected foolishly overwhelmed by the crash of organs and is chanted god knows how most choirs when they intone it like to imitate the rumbling and gurgling of water-pipes others the grating of rattles the creaking of pulleys the grinding of a crane but in spite of all its beauty remains unextinguished dulled though it be by the wild bellowing of the singers the sudden silence in the church roused durtal he rose and looked about him in his corner was no one save two poor women asleep their feet on the bars of chairs their heads on their knees leaning forward a little he saw hanging above him in a dark chapel the light of a lamp like a ruby in its red glass no sound save the military tread of the suisse making his round in the distance durtal sat down again the sweetness of his solitude was enhanced by the aromatic perfume of wax and the memories now faint of incense but it was suddenly broken as the first chords crashed on the organ durtal recognized the dies irae that despairing hymn of the middle ages instinctively he bowed his head and listened this was no more as in the de profundis and humble supplication a suffering which believes it has been heard and discerns a path of light to guide it in the darkness no longer the prayer which has hope enough not to tremble it was the cry of absolute desolation and of terror and indeed the wrath divine breathed tempestuously through these stanzas they seemed addressed less to the god of mercy to the son who listens to prayer than to the inflexible father to him whom the old testament shows us overcome with anger scarcely appeased by the smoke of the pyres the inconceivable attractions of burnt offerings in this chant it asserted itself still more savagely for it threatened to strike the waters and break in pieces the mountains and to rend asunder the depths of heaven by thunderbolts and the earth alarmed cried out in fear a crystalline voice a clear child's voice proclaimed in the nave the tidings of these cataclysms 
and after this the choir chanted new strophes wherein the implacable judge came with shattering blare of trumpet to purify by fire the rottenness of the world then in its turn a bass deep as a vault as though issuing from the crypt accentuated the horror of these prophecies made these threats more overwhelming and after a short strain by the choir an alto repeated them in yet more detail then so soon as the awful poem had exhausted the enumeration of chastisement and suffering in shrill tones the falsetto of a little boy the name of jesus went by and a light broke in on the thundercloud the panting universe cried for pardon recalling by all the voices of the choir the infinite mercies of the saviour and his pardon pleading with him for absolution as formerly he had spared the penitent thief and the magdalen but in the same despairing and headstrong melody the tempest raged again drowned with its waves the half-seen shores of heaven and the solos continued discouraged interrupted by the recurrent weeping of the choir giving with the diversity of voices a body to the special conditions of shame the particular states of fear the different ages of tears at last when still mixed and blended these voices had borne away on the great waters of the organ all the wreckage of human sorrows all the boys of prayers and tears they fell exhausted paralyzed by terror wailing and sighing like a child who hides its face stammering dona eis requiem they ended worn out in an amen so plaintive that it died away in a breath above the sobbing of the organ what man could have imagined such despair dreamed of such disasters and durtal made answer to himself no man in fact the attempt has been vain to discover the author both of the music and of the sequence they have been attributed to frangipani thomas of Celano, saint bernard and a crowd of others and they have remained anonymous simply formed by the sad alluvial deposits of the age the dies irae seemed to have at first fallen like a seed of desolation among the distracted souls of the eleventh century it germinated there and grew slowly nurtured by the sap of anguish watered by the rain of tears it was at last pruned when it seemed ripe and had perhaps thrown out too many branches for in one of the earliest known texts a stanza which has since disappeared called up the magnificent and barbarous image of an earth revolving as it belched forth flames while the constellations burst into shards and heaven shrivelled like a parched scroll all this concluded durtal does not prevent these triple stanzas woven of shadow and cold full of reverberating rhymes and hard echoes this music of rude stuff which wraps the phrases like a shroud and masks the rigid outlines of the work from being admirable yet that chant which constrains and renders with such energy the breadth of the sequence that melodic period which without variation remaining always the same succeeds in expressing by turns prayer and terror moves me less than the de profundis which yet has not its grandiose spaciousness nor that artistic cry of despair but chanted to the organ the psalm is earthy and suffocating it comes from out the very depths of the sepulchre while the dies irae has its source only on the sill of the tomb the first is the very voice of the dead the second that of the living who inter him and the dead man weeps but takes courage a little when those that bury him despair to sum up durtal concluded i prefer the text of the dies irae to that of the de profundis and the melody of the de profundis to that of the dies irae it is true also that this last sequence is modernized and chanted theatrically here without the imposing and needful march of unison this time for instance it is devoid of interest he continued ceasing his thoughts for a moment to listen to the piece of modern music which the choir was just then rendering ah who will take on himself to proscribe that pert mysticism those fonts of toilet water which gounod invented there ought indeed to be astonishing penalties for choir masters who allow such musical effeminacy in church this is as it was this morning at the madeleine when i happened to be present at the interminable funeral of an old banker they played a military march with violin and violoncello accompaniments with trumpets and timbrels a heroic and worldly march to celebrate the departure and the decomposition of a financier it is too absurd and listening no more to the music in saint sulpice durtal transferred himself in thought to the madeleine and went off at full speed in his dreams indeed he said to himself the clergy make jesus like a tourist when they invite him daily to come down into that church whose exterior is surmounted by no cross 
and whose interior is like the grand reception room at an hotel but how can you make those priests understand that ugliness is sacrilege and that nothing is equal to the frightful sin of this confusion of romanesque and greek these pictures of aged men that flat ceiling studded with skylights from which filter in all weathers the spoiled gleams of a rainy day to that futile altar surmounted by a circle of angels who in discreet abandonment dance in honour of our lady a motionless marble rigadoon yet in the madeleine at a funeral when the door opens and the corpse advances in a gap of daylight all is changed like a super-terrestrial antiseptic an extra-human disinfectant the liturgy purifies and cleanses the impious ugliness of the place and thinking over his memories of the morning durtal saw again as he closed his eyes at the end of the semicircular apse the procession of red and black robes white surplices joining in front of the altar descending the steps together making their way together to the catafalque dividing again on each side joining to mix afresh in the great gangway between the chairs this slow and silent procession led by incomparable suisses in mourning their swords horizontal and a general's epaulettes in jet advanced preceded by a cross in front of the corpse laid on trestles and far off in all that confusion of lights falling from the roof and lighted flambeaux around the catafalque and on the altar the white of the tapers disappeared and the priests who bore them seemed to march with empty hands uplifted as though to point out the stars which accompanied them twinkling above their heads then when the bier was surrounded by the clergy the de profundis burst forth from the depths of the sanctuary intoned by invisible singers that was good said durtal to himself at the madeleine the voices of the children are sharp and feeble and the basses are badly trained and failing we are evidently far from the choir of saint sulpice but all the same it was superb then what a moment was that of the priest's communion when suddenly arising from the murmuring of the choir the voice of the tenor threw above the corpse the magnificent plain chant antiphon requiem eternam dona eis domine et lux perpetua luce at eis it seems that after all the lamentations of the de profundis and the dies irae the presence of god who comes then upon the altar brings consolation and sanctions the confident and solemn pride of that melodious phrase which then invokes christ without dread and without tears the mass ended the celebrant disappeared and as at the moment when the corpse entered the clergy preceded by the suisses advanced towards the body and in the blazing circle of the tapers a priest in his cope said the mighty prayers of the general absolution then the liturgy took a higher tone and became still more admirable mediative between the sinner and the judge the church by the mouth of her priest implores the lord to pardon the poor soul non in judicium cum servo tuo domini then after the amen given by the organ and all the choir a voice arose in the silence and spoke in the name of the dead liberame and the choir continued the old chant of the tenth century just as in the dies irae which appropriates to itself fragments of these plaints the last judgment flamed out and pitiless responses declare to the dead the reality of his alarms declare to him that at the end of time the judge will come with the crash of thunder to chastise the world the priest marched round the catafalque sprinkling it with beads of holy water incensed it gave shelter to the poor weeping soul consoled it took it to himself covered it as it were with his cope and again intervened to pray that after so much weariness and sorrow the lord will permit the unhappy one to sleep the sleep that knows no waking far from earth's noises never in any religion has a more charitable part a more august mission been assigned to man lifted by his consecration wholly above humanity almost deified by the sacerdotal office the priest while earth laments or is silent can advance to the brink of the abyss and intercede for the being whom the church has baptized as an infant who has no doubt forgotten her since that day and may even have persecuted her up to the hour of his death nor does the church shrink from the task before that fleshly dust heaped in a chest she thinks of that sewage of the soul and cries from the gates of hell deliver him o lord but at the end of the general absolution at the moment when the procession turning its back is on the way to the sacristy she too seems disquieted 
perhaps recalling in an instant the ill deeds done by that body while it was alive she seemed to doubt if her supplications were heard and the doubt her words would not frame passed into the intonation of the last amen murmured at the madeleine by children's voices timid and distant plaintive and sweet this amen said we have done what we could but but and in the funereal silence which followed the clergy leaving the nave there remained only the ignoble reality of the empty husk lifted in the arms of men thrust into a carriage like the refuse of the shambles carted off each morning to be made into soap at the factories if continued durtal in opposition to these sad prayers these eloquent absolutions we call up before us a marriage mass all is changed there the church is disarmed and her musical liturgy is as naught then she may well play mendelssohn's wedding march and borrow from profane authors the gaiety of their songs to celebrate the brief and empty joy of the body imagine and indeed it happens the canticle of the virgin used to magnify the glad impatience of a bride fancy the te deum to him the blessedness of a bridegroom far away from this infamous barter of the flesh plain chant remains shut up in the antiphonaries like a monk in the cloister and when it goes forth it is to cast up before christ his garnered pains and sorrows it gathers and sums them up in admirable supplications and if fatigued with pleading it adores its impulse is to glorify eternal events palm sunday and easter pentecost and the ascension epiphany and christmas then its joy bursts forth so magnificently that it springs beyond the world to show its ecstatic joy at the feet of god as to the very ceremonies of the funeral they are now only the regular way of getting money an official routine a prayer wheel which is turned mechanically without thought of it the organist while he plays thinks of his family and considers how wearied he is the bellows blower thinks as he fills the pipes of the half pint which will dry his sweat the tenors and basses are careful of their effects and admire themselves in the more or less rippled water of their voices the choir boys dream of their scampers after mass and moreover not one of them at all understands a word of the latin they sing and abridge as for instance the dies irae of which they suppress a part of the stanzas in its turn beedledom calculates the sum the dead man brings in and even the priest wearied with the prayers of which he has read so many and needing his breakfast prays mechanically from the lips outward while the assistants are in a hurry that the mass to which they have not listened should come to an end that they may shake hands with the relations and leave the dead there is absolute inattention profound weariness yet how terrible is that thing on the trestles that is waiting there in the church that empty dwelling-place that body which is already breaking up liquid manure that stinks gases which evaporate flesh that rots is all that remains and the soul now that life is over and all begins no one thinks of it not even the family worn out by the length of the service absorbed in their own sorrow who in fact regret only the visible presence of the being they have lost no one except myself thought durtal and a few curious people who associate themselves in their alarm with the dies irae and the libera of which they understand both the language and the meaning then by the external sound of the words without the aid of contemplation without even the help of thought the church acts there it is the miracle of her liturgy the power of her word the constantly renewed prodigy of phrases created by revolving time of prayers arranged by ages which are dead all has passed nothing exists that was raised up in those bygone times yet those sequences remain intact cried aloud by indifferent voices and cast out from empty hearts plead groan and implore even with efficacy by their virtual power their talismanic might their inalienable beauty by the almighty confidence of their faith the middle ages have left us these to help us to save if it may be the soul of the modern and dead fine gentleman at the present time concluded durtal there is nothing left peculiar to paris but the ceremonies very like each other of taking the veil and of funerals it is unfortunate that when we have to do with a sumptuous corpse undertakers have their way they then bring out their terrible upholstery plated statues of our lady in atrocious taste 
zinc basins in which blaze bowls of green punch tin candelabra at the end of a branch like a cannon on end with its mouth upwards supporting spiders on their backs with burning candles set about their legs all the funeral ironmongery of the first empire with curtain rods in relief acanthus leaves winged hourglasses lozenges and greek frets it is unfortunate too that to touch up the miserable furniture of these ceremonies they play massanet and dubois benjamin godard and vidor or worse still the sacristy orchestra mystical bellowing such as the women sing who are affiliated to the confraternities of the month of may and alas we hear no longer the tempests of the great organs and the majestic dollars of plain chant save at the funerals of the moneyed classes for the poor nothing no choir no organ just a handful of prayers then a few dips of the brush in the holy water stoop and there is a dead man the more on whom the rain falls who is carried away but the church knows that the carrion of the rich rots as much as that of the poor while his soul stinks more but she jobs indulgences and haggles about masses she even she is consumed by the lust of gold yet i must not think too ill of these wealthy fools said durtal after silent thought for after all it is thanks to them that i can hear the admirable liturgy of the burial service these people who perhaps have done no good action in their life do at least this kindness to a few without knowing it after their death a noise recalled him to saint sulpice the choir was going the church was about to close i might as well have tried to pray he said to himself it would have been better than to dream in the empty church on a chair pray indeed i have no desire for it i am haunted by catholicism intoxicated by its atmosphere of incense and wax i prowl about it moved even to tears by its prayers touched even to the marrow by its psalms and chants i am thoroughly disgusted with my life very tired of myself but it is a far cry from that to leading a different existence and yet and yet if i am perturbed in these chapels i become unmoved and dry again as soon as i leave them after all he said to himself getting up and following the few persons who were moving towards a door driven out by the suisse after all my heart is hardened and smoke dried by dissipation i am good for nothing end of part one chapter one Part One, Chapter Two of En Route by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How had he again become a Catholic and got to this point? Durtal answered himself, "I cannot tell. All that I know is that, having been for years an unbeliever, I suddenly believe." Let us see," he said to himself. "Let us try at least to consider if." however great the obscurity of such a subject there be not common sense in it after all my surprise depends on preconceived ideas of conversions i have heard of sudden and violent crises of the soul of a thunderbolt or even of faith exploding at last in ground slowly and cleverly mined it is quite evident that conversions may happen in one or other of these two ways for god acts as may seem good to him but there must be also a third means and this no doubt the most usual which the saviour has used in my case and i know not in what this consists it is something analogous to digestion in a stomach which works though we do not feel it there has been no road to damascus no events to bring about a crisis nothing has happened we awake some fine morning and without knowing how or why the thing is done yes but in fact this manoeuvre is very like that of the mine which only explodes after it has been deeply dug yet not so for in that case the operations are material the objections in the way are resolved i might have reasoned following the course of the spark along the thread but in this case no i sprang unexpectedly without warning without even having suspected that i was so carefully sapped nor was it a clap of thunder unless i admit that a clap of thunder can be occult and silent strange and gentle and this again would be untrue for sudden disorder of the soul almost always follows a misfortune or a crime an act of which we are aware no the one thing which seems certain in my case is that there has been divine impulse grace but 
said he in that case the psychology of conversion is worthless and he made answer to himself that seems to be so for i seek in vain to retrace the stages through which i have passed no doubt i can distinguish here and there some landmarks on the road i have travelled love of art heredity weariness of life i can even recall some of the forgotten sensations of childhood the subterranean workings of ideas excited by my visits to the churches but i am unable to gather these threads together and group them in a skein i cannot understand the sudden and silent explosion of light which took place in me when i seek to explain to myself how one evening an unbeliever i became without knowing it on one night a believer i can discover nothing for the divine action has vanished and left no trace it is certain he continued after silent thought that in these cases the virgin acts upon us it is she who moulds and places us in the hands of her son but her fingers are so light so supple so caressing that the soul they have handled has felt nothing on the other hand if i ignore the course and stages of my conversion i can at least guess the motives which after a life of indifference have brought me into the harbours of the church made me wander round her borders and finally gave me a shove from behind to bring me in and he said to himself without more ado there are three causes first the atavism of an old and pious family scattered among the monasteries and the memories of childhood returned to him of cousins of aunts seen in convent parlours gentle women and grave white as wafers who alarmed him by their low voices who troubled him by their looks and asked if he were a good boy he felt a sort of terror and hid himself in his mother's skirts trembling when he went away and was obliged to bend his brow to those colourless lips and undergo the touch of a chilly kiss now that he thought of them at a distance the interviews which had wearied him so much in his childhood seemed to him charming he put into them all the poetry of the cloister clothed those bare parlours with a faded scent of wainscoting and of wax and he saw again the convent gardens through which he had passed impregnated with the bitter salt scent of box planted with clipped hedges intermingled with trellises whose green grapes never ripened divided by benches whose mouldering stone kept the traces worn by water and a thousand details came back to him of those silent lime alleys of the paths where he ran in the interlaced shade which branches threw upon the ground these gardens had seemed to him to become larger as he grew older and he retained a somewhat confused memory of them amid which was the vague recollection of an old stately park and of a presbytery orchard in the north always somewhat damp even when the sun shone it was not surprising that these sensations transformed by time had left in him some traces of pious thought which grew deeper as his mind embellished them all this might have fermented indistinctly for thirty years and now began to work but the two other causes which he knew must have been still more active these were his disgust for his life and his passion for art and the disgust was certainly aggravated by his solitude and his idleness after having in old days made friends by chance and having taken the impression of souls which had nothing in common with his own he had at last chosen after much useless vagabondage he had become the intimate friend of a certain dr des hermies a physician who devoted much attention to demoniac possession and to mysticism and of a breton named carré the bell-ringer at saint sulpice these friendships were not like those he had formerly made entirely superficial and external they were wide and deep based on similarity of thought and the indissoluble ties of soul and these had been roughly broken within two months of each other des hermies and carré died the former of typhoid fever the latter of a chill that prostrated him in his tower after he had rung the evening angelus these were frightful blows for durtal his life now without an anchor drifted he wandered all astray declaring to himself that this desolation was final since he had reached an age at which new friends are not made so he lived alone apart among his books but the solitude which he bore bravely when he was occupied when he was writing a book became intolerable to him now that he was idle he lounged in an armchair in the afternoons and abandoned himself to his dreams then especially fixed ideas took hold on him 
and these ended by playing pantomimes of which the scenes never varied behind the lowered curtain of his eyes nude figures danced in his brain to the tune of psalms and he woke from these dreams weak and panting ready if a priest had been there to throw himself at his feet with tears just as he would have abandoned himself to the basest pleasures had the temptation suddenly come to him let me chase away these phantoms by work he cried but at what should he work he had just published the life of gilles de Ray, which might interest a few artists and he now remained without a subject on the hunt for a book as in art he was a man of extremes he always went from one excess to the other and after having dived into the satanism of the middle ages in his account of marshal de Ray, he saw nothing so interesting to investigate as the life of a saint some lines which he had discovered in Goerus's and ribet's studies in mysticism had put him on the trace of a certain blessed lidwine in search of new documents but admitting that he could unearth anything about her could he write the life of a saint he did not believe it and the arguments on which he based his opinion seemed plausible had geography was now a lost branch of art as completely lost as wood carving and the miniatures of the old missals nowadays it is only treated by church officers and priests by those stylistic agents who seem when they write to put the embryos of their ideas on ballast trucks and in their hands it has become a commonplace of goody-goody a translation into a book of the statuettes of Froc robert and the coloured images of boisse the way then was free and it seemed at first easy enough to plan it out but to extract the charm of the legends needed the simple language of bygone centuries the ingenuous phrases of the days that are dead who in our time can express the melancholy essence the pale perfume of the ancient translations of the golden legend of voragine how bind in one bright posy the plaintive flowers which the monks cultivated in their cloistered enclosures when hagiography was the sister of the barbaric and delightful art of the illuminators and glass stainers of the ardent and chaste paintings of the early masters yet we may not think of giving ourselves over to studious imitations nor coldly attempt to ape such works as these the question remains whether we can with the present artistic resources succeed in setting up the humble yet lofty figure of a saint and this is at least doubtful for the lack of real simplicity the over ingenious art of style the tricks of careful design and the false craft of colour would probably transform the elect lady into a strolling player she would no longer be a saint but an actress who rendered the part more or less adroitly and then the charm would be destroyed the miracles would seem mechanical the episodes would be absurd then then one must have a lively faith and believe in the sanctity of one's heroine if one would try to exhume her and put her alive again in a book this is so true that we may examine gustave flaubert's admirable pages on the legend of saint julien the hospitaller their development is like a dazzling yet regulated tumult evolved in superb language whose apparent simplicity is only due to the complicated ingenuity of consummate skill all is there all except the accent which would have made this work a true masterpiece given the subject the fire which should course through these magnificent phrases is absent there lacks the cry of the love that faints the gift of the superhuman exile the mystical soul on the other hand Elo's physiognomie de saint are worth reading faith flashes out in each of his portraits enthusiasm runs over in each chapter unexpected allusions form deep reservoirs of thought between the lines but after all elo was so little of an artist that the fairest legends fade when his fingers touch them the meanness of his style impoverishes the miracles and renders them ineffectual the art is lacking which would rescue the book from the category of pale and dead publications the example of these two men in complete opposition as ever writers were neither of whom attained perfection one in the legend of saint julien because faith was wanting the other because his art was poor and narrow thoroughly discouraged durtal he ought to be both at once and yet remain himself if not there was no good in buckling to for such a task it were better to be silent and he threw himself back in his chair sullen and hopeless then the contempt of his desolate life grew upon him and once more he wondered what interest providence could have in thus tormenting the descendants of the first convicts if there were no answer he was obliged to admit that the church in these disasters gathered up the waifs sheltered the shipwrecked brought them home again 
and assured them a resting place no more than schopenhauer whom he had once admired but whose plan of labelling every one before death and whose herbarium of dry sorrows had wearied him as the church deceived man nor sought to decoy him by boasting the mercy of a life which she knew to be ignoble in all her inspired books she proclaims the horror of fate and mourns over the enforced task of living ecclesiasticus ecclesiastes the book of job the lamentations of jeremias manifest this sorrow in their every line and the middle ages too in the imitation of jesus christ cursed existence and cried out loudly for death more plainly than schopenhauer the church declared that there is nothing to wish for here below nothing to expect but where the mere catalogues of the philosopher stop the church went on overpassing the limits of the senses declared the end of man and defined his limitations then he said to himself if it be well considered the vaunted argument of schopenhauer against the creator drawn from the misery and injustice of the world is not irrefutable for the world is not as god made it but as man has refashioned it before accusing heaven for our ills it is no doubt fitting to examine through what phases of consent through what voluntary falls the creature has passed before ending in the gloomy disaster it deplores we may well curse the vices of our ancestors and our own passions which beget the greater part of the woes from which we suffer we may well loathe the civilization which has rendered life intolerable to cleanly souls and not the lord who perhaps did not create us to be shot down by cannon in time of war to be cheated robbed and stripped in time of peace by the slave drivers of commerce and the brigands of the money market but that which remains forever incomprehensible is the initial horror the horror imposed on each of us of having to live and that is a mystery no philosophy can explain ah he went on when i think of that horror that disgust of existence which has for years and years increased in me i understand how i am forced to make for the church the only port where i can find shelter once i despised her because i had a staff on which to lean when the great winds of weariness blew i believed in my novels i worked at my history i had my art i have come to recognize its absolute inadequacy its complete incapacity to afford happiness then i understood that pessimism was at most good to console those who had no real need of comfort i understood that its theories alluring when we are young and rich and well become singularly weak and lamentably false when age advances when infirmities declare themselves when all around is crumbling i went to the church that hospital for souls there at least they take you in put you to bed and nurse you they do not merely turn their backs on you as in the wards of pessimism and tell you the name of your disease finally durtal had been brought back to religion by art more even than his disgust for life art had been the irresistible magnet which drew him to god the day when out of curiosity and to kill time he had entered a church and after so many years of forgetfulness had heard the vespers for the dead fall heavily psalm after psalm in antiphonal chant as the singers threw up like ditches their shovels full of verses his soul had been shaken to its depths the evenings when he had listened at saint sulpice to the admirable chanting during the octave of all souls he had felt himself caught once for all but that which had put most pressure on him and brought him yet more completely into bondage were the ceremonies and music of holy week he had visited the churches during that week and they had opened to him like palaces ruined like cemeteries laid waste by god they were forbidding with their veiled images their crucifixes wrapped lozenge-wise in purple their organs dumb their bells silent the crowd flowed in busy but noiseless along the floor over the immense cross formed by the nave and the two transepts and entering by the wounds of which the doors were figures they went up to the altar where the blood-stained head of christ would lie and there on their knees eagerly kissed the crucifix which marked the place of the chin below the steps and the crowd itself as it ran in the cruciform mould of the church became itself an enormous cross living and crawling silent and sombre at saint sulpice where the whole assembled seminary lamented the ignominy of human justice and the foreordained death of a god durtal had followed the incomparable officers of those mournful days through all their black minutes 
and listened to the infinite sadness of the passion so nobly and profoundly expressed at tenebre by the slow chanting of the lamentations and the psalms but when he thought it over that which above all made him shudder was the thought of the virgin coming on the scene on the thursday at nightfall the church till then absorbed in her sorrow and prostrate before the cross raised herself and fell a-weeping on beholding the mother by all the voices of the choir it pressed round mary endeavouring to console her mixing the tears of the stabat mater with her own sighing out that music of plaintive weeping pressing the wound of that sequence which gave forth water and blood like the wound of christ himself durtal left the church worn out with these long services but his temptations to unbelief were gone he had no further doubt it seemed to him that at saint sulpice grace mixed with the eloquent splendours of the liturgies and that in the dim sorrow of the voices there had been appeals to him and he therefore felt filial gratitude to that church where he had lived through hours so sweet and sad yet in ordinary weeks he did not go there it seemed to him too great and too cold and it was so ugly he preferred warmer and smaller sanctuaries in which there were still traces of the middle ages thus on idle days when he came out of the louvre where he had strayed for a long time before the canvases of the early painters he was wont to take refuge in the old church of saint severin hidden away in a corner of the poorer part of paris he carried with him the visions of the canvases he had admired at the louvre and contemplated them again in this surrounding where they were thoroughly at home then he spent delightful moments in which he was carried away in the clouds of harmony divided by the white splendour of a child's voice flashing out from the rolling thunder of the organ there without even praying he felt a plaintive languor a vague uneasiness steal over him saint severin delighted him aided him more than other churches on some days to gain an indescribable impression of joy and pity sometimes even when he thought of the filth of his senses to weave together the regret and the terror of his soul he often went there especially on sunday mornings to high mass at ten o'clock he was wont to place himself behind the high altar in that melancholy and delicate apse planted like a winter garden with rare and somewhat fantastic trees it might have been called a petrified arbour of very old trunks in flower but stripped of leaf forests of pillars squared or cut in broad panels carved with regular notches near the base hollowed through their whole length like rhubarb stalks channelled like celery no vegetation expanded at the summit of those trunks which bent their naked boughs along the vaulting joined and met and gathered at their junction and thin engrafted knots extravagant bunches of heraldic roses armorial flowers with open tracery and for more than four hundred years no sap had run no bud had formed in these trees the shafts bent forever remained untouched the white bark of these pillars was scarcely worn but the greater part of the flowers were withered the heraldic petals were wanting some keystones of the arches had only stratified calices open like nests with holes like sponges in rags like handfuls of russet lace and among this mystic flora amid these petrified trees there was one strange and charming which suggested the fanciful idea that the blue smoke of the rolling incense had condensed and as it coagulated had grown pale with age to form in twisting the spiral of a column which was inverted on itself and ended broadening out into a sheaf whereof the broken stems fell from above the branches the corner where durtal took refuge was faintly lighted by pointed stained windows with black diamond-shaped divisions set with minute panes darkened by the accumulated dust of years rendered still more obscure by the woodwork of the chapels which cut off half their surface this apse might have been called a frozen grove of skeleton trees a conservatory of dead specimens belonging to the palm family calling up the memory of an impossible phoenix and unlikely palms but it also recalled by its half-moon shape and doubtful light the image of a ship's prow below water in fact it allowed to filter through its bars to its windows trellised with all black network the murmur suggested by the rolling of the carriages which shook the street of a river which sifted the golden light of day through the briny course of its waters on sundays at the time of high mass the apse was empty the public filled the nave before the high altar or spread themselves somewhat further into a chapel dedicated to our lady 
durtal was therefore almost alone and even the people who crossed his refuge were neither stupid nor hostile like the faithful in other churches in this district were beggars the very poor hucksters sisters of charity rag pickers street arabs above all there were women in tatters walking on tiptoe who knelt without looking round poor creatures overwhelmed by the piteous splendour of the altars looking out of the corner of their eyes and bending low when the suisse passed them touched by the timidity of this silent misery durtal listened to the mass chanted by a scanty choir but one patiently taught the choir of saint severin intoned the credo that marvel of plain chant better than it was done at saint sulpice where however the officers were as a rule solemn and correct it bore it as it were to the top of the choir and let it spread with its great wings open and almost without motion above the prostrate flock when the verse et homo factus est took its slow and reverent flight in the low voice of the singer it was at once monumental and fluid indestructible like the articles of the creed itself inspired like the text which the holy spirit dictated in their last meeting to the united apostles of christ at saint severin a powerful voice declaimed a verse as a solo then all the children sustained by the rest of the singers delivered the others and the unchangeable truths declared themselves in their order more attentive more grave more accentuated even a little plaintive in the solo voice of a man more timid perhaps but also more familiar and more joyous in the dash however restrained of the boys at such a moment durtal was roused and exclaimed within himself it is impossible that the alluvial deposits of faith which have created this musical certainty are false the accent of these declarations is such as to be superhuman and far from profane music which has never attained to the solid grandeur of this naked chant the whole mass moreover at saint severin was perfect the kyrie eleison solemn and sumptuous the gloria in excelsis shared by the grand and the choir organs the one taking the solos the other guiding and sustaining the singers was full of exultant joy the sanctus concentrated almost haggard resounded through the arches when the choir shouted the hosanna in excelsis and the agnus dei was sung low to a clear suppliant melody so humble that it dared not become loud indeed except for a contraband or salutaris introduced there as in other churches saint severin maintained on ordinary sundays the musical liturgy sang it almost reverentially with the fragile but well-toned voices of the boys the solidly built basses bringing vigorous sounds from the deep it was a joy to durtal to linger in the delightful surroundings of the middle ages in that shadowy loneliness amid the chants which rose behind him without being annoyed by tricks of the mouths which he could not see he ended by being moved to the very marrow choked by nervous tears and all the bitterness of his life came up before him full of vague fears of confused prayers which stifled him and found no words he cursed the ignominy of his life and swore to master his carnal affections when the mass was over he wandered in the church itself and was delighted with the spring of the nave which four centuries built and sealed with their arms placing on it those strange impressions those wonderful seals which expand in relief under the reversed groining of the arches these centuries combined to bring to the feet of christ the superhuman effort of their art and the gifts of each are still visible the thirteenth century shaped those low and stunted pillars whose capitals are crowned with water lilies water parsley foliage with large leaves voluted with crochets and turned in the form of a crozier the fourteenth century raised the columns of the neighbouring bays on the sides of which prophets monks and saints uphold the spring of the arches the fifteenth and sixteenth created the apse the sanctuary some windows pierced above the choir and though they have been restored by incompetent builders they have still retained a barbaric grace and a really touching simplicity they seem to have been designed by ancestors of the epinal foundries and stained by them with crude colours the donors and the saints who pass through these bright stone-framed pictures are all awkward and pensive dressed in robes of gamboge bottle green prussian blue gooseberry red pumpkin purple and wine leaves and these are made still deeper by contact with the flesh tints either omitted or destroyed which have at any rate remained uncoloured like a thin skin of glass in one of these windows christ on his cross seems limpid all in light 
between blue splashes of sky and the red and green patches formed by the wings of the two angels whose faces also seem cut in crystal and full of light these windows differ from those of other churches in that they absorb the rays of the sun without refracting them no doubt they have been deliberately divested of reflection that they may not by the insolent joyousness of stones on fire insult the melancholy sorrow of this church which rises in the squalid haunts of a quarter inhabited by beggars and thieves then these thoughts assailed durtal in paris the modern churches are useless they remain deaf to the prayers which break against the icy indifference of their walls no man recollects himself in those knaves where souls have left nothing of themselves or where they have perhaps given themselves away have had to turn and fall back on themselves rebuffed by the insolence of a photographic glare darkened by the neglect of those altars at which no saint has ever said mass it seemed that god had always gone out and would only come home to keep his promise to appear at the moment of consecration and that he would retire immediately afterwards despising these edifices which have not been built expressly for him since by the baseness of their form they might be put to any profane use since above all they do not bring him in default of sanctity the only gift which might please him the gift of art which he has lent to man and which allows him to see himself in the abridged restitution of his work and to rejoice in the development of that flower of which he has sowed the seed in souls which he has carefully chosen in souls which are truly the elect second only to those of his saints ah those charitable churches of the middle ages those chapels damp and smoky full of ancient song of exquisite paintings of the odour of extinguished tapers of the perfume of burning incense in paris there remain now only a few specimens of this art of other years a few sanctuaries whose stones really exude the faith among these saint severin seemed to durtal the most exquisite and the most certain he only felt at home there he believed that if he could ever pray in earnest he could do it in that church and he said to himself that there lived the spirit of the fabric it is impossible but that the burning prayers the hopeless sobs of the middle ages have not forever impregnated the pillars and stained the walls it is impossible but that the vine of sorrows whence of old the saints gathered warm clusters of tears has not preserved from those wonderful times emanations which sustain a breath which still awakes the shame for sin and the gift of tears as st agnes remained immaculate in the brothels this church remained intact amid infamous surroundings when all near it in the streets from the chateau rouge to the cremerie alexandre only two paces off the modern rabble of rascality combine their misdeeds mingling with prostitutes their brewage of crime their adulterated absinthe and spirits in this especial territory of satanism the church rises delicate and little closely enveloped in the rags of taverns and hovels and seen far off raises above the roofs its light spire like a netting needle its point below and lifting its eye into the light and air through which can be seen a minute bell surmounting a sort of anvil such it appears at least from the place saint andre des arts symbolically it might be called a piteous appeal always rejected by souls hardened and hammered by vice of that anvil which was only an optical illusion and that very real bell they say thought durtal they say that ignorant architects and unskilled archaeologists wish to free saint severin from its rags and surround it with trees in an enclosed square but it has always lived in its network of black streets and is voluntarily humble in accordance with the miserable district it aids in the middle ages the church was a monument seen only within and not one of those impetuous basilicas which are put up as a show in open spaces then it was an oratory for the poor a church on its knees and not standing it would therefore be the most absolute nonsense to free it from its surroundings to take it out of the day of an eternal twilight out of those hours of shadow which brighten the melancholy beauty of a servant in prayer behind the impious hedge of hovels ah were it possible to steep the church in the glowing atmosphere of notre dame des victoires and join to its meagre psalmody the powerful choir of saint sulpice that would be complete said durtal but alas here below nothing whole nothing perfect exists indeed from an artistic point of view it was the only church which satisfied him for notre dame de paris was too grand and too much overrun by tourists there were few ceremonies there just the necessary amount of prayers were weighed out 
and the greater part of the chapels remained closed and lastly the voices of the choir boys always wanted mending they broke while the advanced age of the basses made them hoarse at saint etienne du mont it was worse still the shell of the church was charming but the choir was an offshoot of the school of saint fourche you might think yourself in a kennel where a medley pack of sick beasts were growling as for the other sanctuaries on the right bank of the river they were worthless plain chant was as far as possible suppressed and the poverty of the voices was everywhere ornamented with promiscuous tunes yet on the right bank were the more self-respecting churches for religious paris stops on that side of the seine and comes to an end as you pass the bridges in fact to sum up all he might believe that saint severin by its scent and the delightful art of its old nave saint sulpice by its ceremonies and its chanting had brought him back towards christian art which in its turn had directed him to god then when once urged on this way he had pursued it had left architecture and music to wander in the mystic territories of the other arts and his long visits to the louvre his researches into the breviaries into the books of reisbrook angela da foligno saint teresa saint catherine of genoa saint magdalene of pazzi had confirmed him in his belief but the upheaval of all his ideas which he had undergone was too recent for his soul at once to regain its equilibrium from time to time it seemed to wish to go back and he discussed with himself in order to set it at rest he spent himself in disputation came to doubt the reality of his conversion and said after all i am united to the church only on the side of art i only go there to see or hear and not to pray i do not seek the lord but my own pleasure this is not business just as in a warm bath i do not feel the cold if i am motionless but if i move i freeze so in the church my impulses are upset when i move i am almost on fire in the nave less warm in the porch and i become perfectly icy outside these are literary postulates vibrations of the nerves skirmishes of thought spiritual brawls whatever you please except faith but what disquieted him still more than the need of helps to feeling was that his shameless senses rebelled at the contact of religious ideas he floated like wreckage between licentiousness and the church they each threw him back in turn obliging him as he approached one to return at once to that which he had left and he was inclined to ask if he were not a victim to some mystification of his lower instincts seeking to revive themselves without his consciousness by the cordial of a false piety in fact he had often seen realized in himself that unclean miracle when he had left saint severin almost in tears insensibly without connection of ideas without any welding together of sensations without the explosion of a spark his senses took fire and he was powerless to let them burn themselves out to resist them he loathed himself afterwards and it was high time then came the reverse movement he longed to run to some chapel there to wash and be clean and he was so disgusted with himself that now and then he went as far as the door and dared not enter at other times on the contrary he rebelled against himself and cried in fury it is monstrous i have in fact spoiled for myself the only pleasure that remained to me the flesh once i amused myself without blame now i pay for my poor debauches with torments i have added one more weariness to existence would that i could undo it he lied to himself in vain trying to justify himself by suggesting doubts suppose all this were not true if there were nothing in it if i were deceiving myself what if the freethinkers were right but he was obliged to be sorry for himself for he felt distinctly to the bottom of his soul that he held unshaken the certitude of true faith these discussions are miserable and the excuses i make for my filthiness are odious he said to himself and a flame of enthusiasm sprang up within him how doubt the truth of dogmas how deny the divine power of the church for she commands assent first she has her superhuman art and her mysticism then she is most wonderful in the persistent folly of conquered heresies all since the world began have had the flesh as their springboard logically and humanly speaking they should have triumphed for they allowed man and woman to satisfy their passions saying to themselves there was no sin in these even sanctifying them as the gnostics rendering homage to god by the foulest uncleanness all have suffered shipwreck the church unbending in this matter has remained upright and entire she orders the body to be silent 
and the soul to suffer and contrary to all probability humanity listens to her and sweeps away like a dung heap the seductive joys proposed to her again the vitality of the church's decision which preserves her in spite of the unfathomable stupidity of her sons she has resisted the disquieting folly of the clergy and has not even been broken up by the awkwardness and lack of ability in her defenders a very strong point no the more i think of her he cried the more i think her prodigious unique the more i am convinced that she alone holds the truth that outside her are only weaknesses of mind impostures scandals the church is the divine breeding-ground the heavenly dispensary of souls she gives them suck nourishes them and heals them she bids them understand when the hour of sorrow comes that true life begins not at birth but at death the church is indefectible before all things admirable she is great yes but then we must follow her directions and practice the sacraments she orders and durtal shaking his head gave himself no further answer end of part one chapter two Part One, Chapter Three of En Route by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Before his conversion, he had said, like all unbelievers, "If I believed that Jesus Christ is God and that eternal life is not a decoy, I would not hesitate to change all my habits, to follow as far as possible the rules of religion, and in any case to live chaste." And he was surprised that people he knew who were in these conditions did not maintain an attitude higher than his own he who had so long indulgently forgiven himself became singularly intolerant so soon as he had to do with the catholic he now understood the injustice of his judgments and confessed that between faith and practice was a gulf difficult to overpass he did not like to discuss this question with himself but it returned and took possession of him all the same and he was obliged to admit the meanness of his arguments the despicable reasons for his resistance he was still honest enough to say i am no longer a child if i have faith if i admit catholicism i cannot conceive it as lukewarm and unfixed warmed up again and again in the saucepan of a false zeal i will have no compromise or truce no alternations of debauch and communions no stages of licentiousness and piety no all or nothing to change from top to bottom or not change at all then he drew back in alarm endeavoured to escape the part he was about to take endeavoured to exculpate himself cavilling for hours invoking the most wretched motives for remaining as he was and not budging a jot what am i to do if i do not obey orders which i feel with increasing force i am preparing for myself a life of uneasiness and remorse for i know well i ought not to remain forever on the threshold but to penetrate into the sanctuary and stay there and if i make up my mind no indeed for then i must bind myself to a heap of observances bend to a series of rules assist at mass on sunday abstain on friday live like a bigot and look like a fool and then to help his revolt he thought of the air the look of people who frequented the churches for two men who looked intelligent and clean how many were without doubt rascals and impostors almost all had a sidelong look an oily voice downcast eyes immovable spectacles clothes like sacristans as if of black wood almost all told thin beads ostentatiously and with more strategy and more knavery than the wicked took toll from their neighbours on leaving god the devout women were still less reassuring they invaded the church walking about as if quite at home disturbing everybody upsetting chairs knocking against you without begging pardon then they knelt down without much ado in the attitude of contrite angels murmured interminable paternosters and left the church more arrogant and sour than before it is not encouraging to have to mix with this flock of pious geese he exclaimed but soon against his will he made answer to himself you have nothing to do with others were you more humble these people would certainly seem less offensive at any rate they have the courage you lack they are not ashamed of their faith and are not afraid to kneel to god in public and durtal remained dumbfounded for he had to admit that the riposte struck home 
it was clear his humility was at fault but what was worse he could not free himself from human respect he was afraid of being taken for a fool the prospect of being seen on his knees in church made his hair stand on end the idea that if he ever had to communicate he would have to rise and go to the altar in the sight of all was intolerable to him if that moment ever come it will be hard to bear said he and yet i am an idiot for what have i to do with the opinion of people i do not know but much as he might repeat that his alarms were absurd he could not get over them or free himself from the fear of ridicule after all he said even if i decide to jump the ditch to confess and communicate that terrible question of the senses would always have to be resolved i must determine to fly the lusts of the flesh and accept perpetual abstinence i could never attain to that without counting that in any case the time would be ill-chosen were i now to make such an effort for never have i been so tormented as since my conversion catholicism unfortunately excites unclean suggestions when i prowl about it without entering and to this exclamation another answered at once yes but you must enter he was irritated at this change of front without change of place and he tried to turn the conversation as though it had been held with another whose questions perplexed him but he came back to it all the same and in his annoyance summoned all his reasoning powers to his aid come let us try to take stock at any rate it is plain that as i have drawn near the church my unclean desires have become more frequent and more persistent and yet another fact is certain that i have been so used up by twenty years of debauchery that i ought not to have any further carnal appetites in fact if i chose it i could perfectly well remain chaste but then i must bid my miserable brain be silent and i have no power to do so it is frightful all the same that i am more excited than in youth for now my desires go a-travelling and since they have not their ordinary shelter they go off in search of evil haunts how may this be explained it is a sort of dyspepsia of the soul which cannot digest ordinary meats and tries to feed on spiced dreams highly seasoned thoughts it is then want of appetite for wholesome meals which has begotten this greediness for strange dishes this trouble of the mind this wish to escape from myself and jump were it but for a moment over the permitted limits of the senses in that case catholicism would play a part at once repellent and depressing it would stimulate these sick desires and weaken me at the same time would give me over to nervous emotions without strength to resist them wandering thus in self-examination he came to a dead stand where was no issue arriving at this conclusion i do not practice my religion because i yield to my baser instincts and i yield to these instincts because i do not practice my religion brought up thus by a dead wall he resisted asking if this last observation were indeed true for after all nothing proved that if he approached the sacraments he would not be attacked with even greater violence it was even probable he would be for the devil makes a dead set at pious people then he rebelled against the cowardice of these remarks and cried i lie for i know well that if i made the least sign of resistance i should be powerfully aided from on high clever at self-torture he continued to harass his soul always on the same line suppose he said for the sake of argument that i have tamed my pride and subdued my body suppose that at present there were nothing to do but to go forward i am still brought up for the final obstacle terrifies me up to now i have been able to walk alone without earthly assistance without advice i have been converted without the help of any one but now i cannot make a step without a guide i cannot approach the altar without the aid of an interpreter and the bulwark of a priest and once more he drew back for in former times he had been intimate with a certain number of ecclesiastics and had found them so mediocre so lukewarm above all so hostile to mysticism that he was revolted at the very notion of laying before them the schedule of his requirements and his regrets they will not understand me he thought they will answer that mysticism was interesting in the middle ages but has now become disused and is in any case quite out of touch with the modern spirit they will think me mad will assure me moreover that god does not want so much will advise me with a smile not to make myself singular to do as others and to think like them i have indeed no intention of entering on the way of mysticism 
but they may at least allow me to envy it and not inflict on me their middle-class ideal of a god for not to deceive oneself catholicism is not only that moderate religion that they offer us it is not composed only of petty cases and formulas it is not wholly confined to rigid observances and the toys of old maids to all that goody-goody business which spreads itself abroad in the rue saint sulpice it is far more exalted far purer but then we must penetrate its burning zone and seek in mysticism the art the essence and the very soul of the church using the powerful means at her disposal we then have to empty ourselves and strip the soul so that christ if he will may enter it we have to purify the house to cleanse it with the disinfectant of prayer and the sublimate of sacraments in a word to be ready when the guest shall come and bid us to empty ourselves wholly into him as he will pour himself into us i know thoroughly well that this divine alchemy this transmutation of the human creature into god is generally impossible for the saviour as a rule keeps his singular favours for his elect but after all every one however unworthy is presumably able to attain that majestic end since god only decides and not man whose humble acquiescence alone is requisite i see myself saying that to the priests they will tell me i have no business with mystical ideas and will give me in exchange the petty religion of rich women they will wish to mix themselves up with my life to inquire about the state of my soul to insinuate their own tastes they will try to convince me that art is dangerous will sermonize me with imbecile talk and pour over me their flowing bowls of pious veal broth i know what i am at the end of a couple of interviews i shall rebel and become wicked durtal shook his head remained in thought and began again yet one must be just perhaps the secular clergy are only the leavings for the contemplative orders and the missionary army carry away every year the pick of the spiritual basket the mystics priests athirst for sorrows drunk with sacrifice bury themselves in cloisters or exile themselves among savages whom they teach so when the cream is off the rest of the clergy are plainly but skim milk the scourings of the seminaries yes but after all he continued the question is not whether they are intelligent or narrow it is not my business to take the priest to pieces to discover under the consecrated rind the nothingness of the man not my business to abuse his inadequacy since it is thoroughly suited to the understanding of the crowd would it not be after all more courageous and more humble to kneel before a being of whose brains you know the weakness and then then i am not reduced to that for indeed i know one in paris a true mystic suppose i go and see him and he thought of a certain abbe gevresin with whom he had formerly some acquaintance he had often met him at a bookseller's in the rue servandoni old tocan who had rare books on liturgy and the lives of the saints learning that durtal was looking for works on blessed lidwine the priest was at once interested in him and on leaving the shop they had a long conversation the abbe was very old and walked with difficulty therefore he willingly took durtal's arm who saw him home the life of that victim of the sins of her time is a magnificent subject he said you remember it do you not and as they walked he sketched its lines broadly lidwine was born towards the end of the fourteenth century at schiedam in holland her beauty was extraordinary but she lost it through illness at the age of fifteen she recovered but while skating one day with her companions on the frozen canals she fell and broke a rib from the time of that accident to her death she was bedridden she was afflicted with most frightful ailments her wounds festered and worms bred in her putrefying flesh erysipelas that terrible malady of the middle ages consumed her her right arm was eaten away a single muscle held it to the body her brow was cleft in two one of her eyes became blind and the other so weak that it could not bear the light while she was in this condition the plague ravaged holland and decimated the town in which she lived she was the first attacked two boils formed one under her arm the other above the heart two boils it is well she said to the lord but three would be better in honour of the holy trinity and immediately a third pustule broke out on her face for thirty-five years she lived in a cellar taking no solid food praying and weeping so chilly in winter that each morning her tears formed two frozen streams down her cheeks she thought herself still too fortunate and entreated the lord not to spare her and obtained from him the grace that by her sufferings she might expiate the sins of others 
christ heard her prayers visited her with his angels communicated her with his own hand gave her the delight of heavenly ecstasies and caused her festering wounds to exhale delicious perfumes at the moment of her death he stood by her and restored her poor body to its former soundness her beauty so long vanished shone out again the town was moved the sick came in crowds and all who drew near were healed she is the true patroness of the sick concluded the abbe and after a silence he added from the point of view of the higher mysticism lidwine is wonderful for in her we can verify that plan of substitution which was and is the glorious reason for the existence of convents and as without answering durtal questioned him with a look he went on you are aware sir that in all ages nuns have offered themselves to heaven as expiatory victims the lives of saints both men and women who desired these sacrifices abound of those who atoned for the sins of others by sufferings eagerly demanded and patiently borne but there is a task still more arduous and more painful than was desired by these admirable souls it is not now that of purging the faults of others but of preventing them hindering their commission by taking the place of those who are too weak to bear the shock read saint teresa on this subject you will see that she gained permission to take on herself and without flinching the temptations of a priest who could not endure them this substitution of a strong soul freeing one who is not strong from perils and fears is one of the great rules of mysticism sometimes this exchange is purely spiritual sometimes on the contrary it has to do only with the ills of the body saint teresa was the surrogate of souls in torment sister catherine emmerich took the place of the sick relieved at least those who were most suffering thus for instance she was able to undergo the agony of a woman suffering from consumption and dropsy in order to permit her to prepare for death in peace well lidwine took on herself all bodily ills she lusted for physical suffering and was greedy for wounds she was as it were the reaper of punishments and she was also the piteous vessel in which every one discharged the overflowings of his malady if you would speak of her in other fashion than the poor hagiographies of our day study first that law of substitution that miracle of perfect charity that superhuman triumph of mysticism that will be the stem of your book and naturally without effort all lidwine's acts graft themselves on it but asked durtal does this law still take effect yes i know convents which apply it moreover orders like the carmelites and the poor clares willingly accept the transfer to them of temptations we suffer then these convents take on their backs so to speak the diabolical expiations of those insolvent souls whose debts they pay to the full all the same said durtal shaking his head if you consent to take on yourself the assaults intended for your neighbour you must make pretty sure not to sink the nuns chosen by our lord replied the abbe as victims of expiation as whole burnt offerings are in fact few and they are generally especially in this age obliged to unite and coalesce in order to bear without failing the weight of misdeeds which try them for in order that a soul may bear alone the assaults of satan which are often terrible it must be indeed assisted by the angels and elect of god and after a silence the old priest added i believe i may speak with some experience in these matters for i am one of the directors of those nuns who make reparation in their convents and yet cried durtal the world asks what is the good of the contemplative orders they are the lightning conductors of society said the abbe with great energy they draw on themselves the demoniacal fluid they absorb temptations to vice preserve by their prayers those who live like ourselves in sin they appease in fact the wrath of the most high that he may not place the earth under an interdict ah while the sisters who devote themselves to nursing the sick and infirm are indeed admirable their task is easy in comparison with that undertaken by the cloistered orders the orders where penance never ceases and the very nights spent in bed are broken by sobs this priest is far more interesting than his brethren said durtal to himself as they parted and as the abbe invited his visits he had often called on him he had always been cordially welcomed on several occasions he had warily sounded the old man on several questions he had answered evasively in regard to other priests but he did not seem to think much of them if durtal might judge by what he said one day in regard to lidwine that magnet of sorrows 
notice he said that a weak and honest soul has every advantage in choosing a confessor not from the clergy who have lost the sense of mysticism but from the monks they alone know the effects of the law of substitution and if they see that in spite of their efforts the penitent succumbs they end by freeing him by taking his trials on themselves or by sending them off to some convent in the country where resolute people can use them another time the question of nationalities was discussed in a newspaper which durtal showed him the abbe shrugged his shoulders putting aside the patriotic twaddle for me he said calmly for me my country is that where i can best pray durtal could not make out what this priest was he understood from the bookseller that the abbe gevresin on account of his great age and infirmity was incapacitated for the regular duties of the priesthood i know that when he can he still says his mass each morning in a convent i believe also he receives a few of his brethren for confession in his own house and tocan added with disdain he has barely enough to live on and they do not look on him with favour at the archbishops because of his mystical notions there ended all he knew about him he is evidently a very good priest repeated durtal his physiognomy declares it and his mouth and eyes contradict each other his eyes certainly declare his entire goodness his lips somewhat thick purple and always moist have on them an affectionate but somewhat sad smile and to this his blue eyes give the lie blue childlike eyes which laugh out astonished under white eyebrows in a rather red face touched on the cheeks like a ripe apricot with little points of blood in any case said durtal waking from his meditations i am very wrong not to continue the relations into which i have entered with him yes but then nothing is so difficult as to become really intimate with a priest first by the very education he receives at the seminary the ecclesiastic thinks himself obliged to disperse his affections and not concentrate himself on particular friendships then like a doctor he is a man harassed with business who is never to be found you can catch them now and then between two confessions or two sick calls nor even then are you quite certain that the eager welcome of the priest rings true for he is just the same to all who come to him and indeed since i do not call on the abbe gevresin for his help or advice i am afraid of being in his way and of taking up his time hence i am acting with discretion in not going to see him yet i am sorry suppose i write or go to him one morning but what have i to say to him i ought to know what i want before i allow myself to trouble him if i go only to complain he will answer i am wrong not to be a communicant and i have nothing to answer no the better plan is to meet him as by chance on the keys where no doubt he sometimes looks over the bookstalls or at tocans for then i can talk to him more intimately at least less officially about my vacillations and regrets so durtal searched the keys and never once met the abbe he went to the booksellers and pretended to look over his stock but as soon as he pronounced the name gevresin tocan exclaimed i have heard nothing of him and he has not been here for the last two months i will not turn back but just disturb him in his own house said durtal but he will wonder why i came back after so long an absence besides the awkwardness i feel in calling on people whom i have neglected i am also troubled by thinking the abbe may suspect some interested object in my visit that is not convenient if i had but a good pretext there is certainly that life of lidwine which interests him i might consult him on various points yes but which i have not concerned myself with that saint for a long time and must read over again the meagre old books on her biography after all it will be simpler and better to be frank and say this is why i have come i want to ask advice which i have not determined to follow but i have so much need of speaking of giving the reins to my soul that i beg you to be so kind as to lose an hour for my sake he will do it certainly and willingly then that is agreed on suppose i go to-morrow but he checked himself at once there was nothing pressing there was plenty of time better take time and think ah yes here is christmas close upon us i cannot decently trouble a priest who has his penitence to confess for there are many communicants on that day let him get his hard work over and then we will see he was at first pleased at having invented that excuse then he had to admit in his heart that after all there was not much in it for there was nothing to show that this priest who was not attached to a parish was busy in hearing confessions it was hardly probable but he tried to convince himself that it might be so after all and his hesitation began again 
angry at last with the discussion he adopted a middle course for greater certainty he would not call on the abbe till after christmas but he would not be later than a given time he took an almanac and swore to keep his promise three days after that feast end of part one chapter three